Is it possible to make sense out of the prophecies of Daniel? In Daniel chapters 8, 9, 11, and 12, Daniel writes about this abomination of desolation in the temple. But each of these four references to this event seem to contradict each other. Then there's a goat that grows a little horn out of one of his four horns in chapter 8. There's the mysterious king of the north and the king of the south in chapter 11. There are periods of 2300 days, 1290 days, and another period of 1335 days, all following this abomination. And what does abomination of desolation even mean? It's all very confusing, or at least it does feel that way at first. Can we put these puzzle pieces together in a sensible way, and can we actually learn anything for certain about future end times prophecy from the book of Daniel? Well, we absolutely can, but to do that, we will have to walk through these chapters carefully. As we do that, we'll find that chapter 9 gives us a lot of information, but most of it is very difficult to interpret without chapters 8, 11, and 12. So then, since chapters 8, 11, and 12 give us the necessary tools to understand chapter 9, and since chapter 9 is such a big chapter, I've decided to split this up a bit. In this video, we'll walk through some of the foundational stuff in chapters 8, 11, and 12 to lay the groundwork for chapter 9. In my next video, I'll try to tackle chapter 9 by itself. Now, in case you missed it, in my last video in this series, I explained what we can learn from the prophecies in Daniel chapters 2, 7, and the beginning of chapter 8. The chapters we will discuss today are built on the foundation of the previous chapters. So let's recap what we found in there. In those visions, Daniel was given an empire countdown to the kingdom of God. He was told that the Babylonian Empire would be followed by three more world empires before the Ancient of Days would come and establish his kingdom on the earth. In chapter 8, we learned that the next two empires after Babylon would be Medo-Persia, then Greece. And we know from history that Babylon was indeed conquered by Persia, and Persia was in fact conquered by Greece. Then, the fourth of these kingdoms, the one that was to be in existence when the kingdom of God came, was not named in these chapters, but was described as dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. I think we'll see when we get to chapter 9 that it was definitely the Roman Empire, but it was said to be in two parts. The first part of this kingdom would be strong and long-lasting like iron. But the final part would be like iron mixed with clay. It would be weak and short-lived. And chapter 7 says that during this end time part, right before the kingdom of God is set up, this last kingdom would be ruled by ten kings. One new king would rise to power by conquering three of those kings. And then this new king would rule wickedly, making war against the saints of God for three and a half times. Then, at the end of this three and a half time war against the saints, this evil king would be destroyed when God set up his kingdom on the earth. If you haven't seen it yet and you're curious about how we arrived at all of those conclusions, then take some time and check out part one in this series where we dive deeper into those visions. Essentially, in this video, we are zooming in to focus on the third kingdom, the kingdom of Greece, and the mysterious fourth and final kingdom that comes before the kingdom of God. Last time, we left off about halfway through chapter 8, so we'll pick up from there in this video. As we discussed, chapter 8 gives us a vision that prophesies of the fall of the Persian Empire to Greece, which is amazing in and of itself because the book of Daniel was written hundreds of years before Greece did in fact conquer Persia. But the chapter doesn't stop there. In this passage, there is a goat with one great horn that represents the king of Greece. But this great horn is broken and is replaced by four new, notable horns. This, the chapter says, represents four kings who would arise to control the Greek empire after the first great king died. 
Some 200 years after Daniel wrote this prophecy, the Persian Empire was conquered by Alexander the Great, the powerful king of the Greek Empire, represented by that one great horn. And when Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided into four parts controlled by four different notable men. Those men were Ptolemy, Cassander, Lysimachus, and Seleucus. But Daniel's vision goes on to explain that out of one of these notable horns grew another little horn. And this little horn is said to magnify himself, that by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and he cast down the truth to the ground. So who is this little horn a picture of? Well, since the prophecy says that the little horn grows out of one of the four notable horns, it must be referring to a king who comes to rule one of the four divisions of the Greek Empire set up by these four notable men. This king apparently will persecute God's people, will bring transgression into the temple or the sanctuary of God, and will pollute the sacrifice in the temple. Daniel writes that this is called the transgression of desolation, and that the sanctuary would be trodden underfoot for 2,300 days until it is afterward cleansed. This aptly describes exactly what we know from history. Nearly 400 years after Daniel wrote this prophecy, an evil man named Antiochus seized control of the Seleucid kingdom of the Greek Empire. Antiochus called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, a word which means the manifestation of God. He magnified himself, and he particularly hated the Jewish religion, which taught that there was only one God, and that that God was not Antiochus. In rage, the king sold the high priesthood of the Jews to the highest bidder, and eventually placed an idol to Zeus, which he thought represented himself, in the temple of God in Jerusalem. He even sacrificed a pig, an unclean animal, on the altar of God and forced Jews to eat pork or else die in the most torturous, horrific ways. This was the abomination that made the temple desolate or unusable for holy purposes, just as Daniel predicted right here in chapter 8. The Jews could not use their temple because it had been defiled. And when the Israeli people revolted, led by the Maccabees, and reclaimed their temple, they had to purify it before it could ever be used again. This purification of the temple is the celebration Jews remember today as Hanukkah, but in New Testament times it was referred to as the Feast of Dedication. So Daniel chapter 8 is all about the Greek Empire, how it would conquer the Persians, how it would be divided into four parts, and then later, in the latter part of the empire, how one of the rulers of one of those four divisions would commit an abomination in the temple of God. The little horn in this chapter is very obviously Antiochus Epiphanes. The transgression of desolation is clearly his wicked defiling of the temple that made it desolate and unusable. And the 2300 days mentioned here must have been the time it took from the defiling of the temple until it was purified after the Maccabean revolt. From a study of history, we can't be sure exactly how many days took place between the abomination and the cleansing, but 2300 days, or 6 years, 4 months, and 20 days, would be about the right time frame. So how does all of this tie into end times events if the prophecy in chapter 8 is already fulfilled? Well, we'll find the answer to that in chapters 11 and 12. So let's skip chapters 9 and 10 for now. We'll get to chapter 9 in the next video, and chapter 10 details an interaction that Daniel had with an angel, but contains no prophecy. It probably tells the backstory of how Daniel received the prophecy that he wrote down in chapters 11 and 12. So let's jump right to chapter 11.
Here, Daniel lists over 100 prophecies about the Greek Empire. In verse 3, he says that there will be a king of Greece who will conquer the Persian Empire, but that his kingdom would be broken and would be divided into the four winds of heaven. Again, this clearly refers to Alexander the Great, whose kingdom was divided to Ptolemy, Seleucus, Cassander, and Lysimachus. Daniel continues for the next 30 verses, speaking about the battles and interactions between the kings of the north and the kings of the south of the Greek Empire. This refers to the kings of the Ptolemaic part of the Greek Empire and the kings of the Seleucid part of the Greek Empire because their territories were to the north and south of the land of Israel. Meaning that these interactions between these two kingdoms often meant battles and travel through the land of the Jews. Each of these 100 plus prophecies tell a detailed and amazingly accurate history of the Greek Empire, even though they were written hundreds of years before these things actually took place. This is just one more proof that the prophecies of Daniel are truly the Word of God. But then, beginning in verse 21, Daniel describes a king of the north, or the Seleucid kingdom of Greece, who is vile and obtains his crown by flatteries. He attacks the king of the south, or the Ptolemaic kingdom, and beats him, and then, when he returns again to conquer the Ptolemaic empire for good, he is met with ships from Chittim, or Cyprus, that prevent him from accomplishing his mission. The prophecy tells us that he is so enraged by this that on his way back to the north, he passes through Israel and takes his anger out on them, taking away the daily sacrifice and setting up in its place an abomination that makes desolate. So we can see that this is very obviously another prophecy about Antiochus Epiphanes. And in fact, he did rise to power by flatteries and alliances, though he was not the rightful blood ruler of the Seleucid kingdom. And he did hate the Jews, persecuting and killing Israelites on multiple occasions as he passed through their land. But as he marched on Alexandria, the capital of the Ptolemaic kingdom, he was met by ships with a Roman delegation. Rome demanded that he cease his war against the Ptolemies or else he would be at war with Rome as well. You see, the Romans didn't want the Greek Empire united under one powerful king. Unfortunately, Antiochus wasn't powerful enough to fight both the Ptolemies and the growing Roman Empire, so he had no choice but to turn around and head home. But on his march back to the north, in his anger, he stopped in Jerusalem and took out his frustration on them, those evil Jews who refused to worship him as God. That's when he placed the altar of Zeus in the temple, sacrificed swine on the altar of God, and polluted the temple, just as Daniel prophesied in chapter 8. And now, as we've seen, it was also prophesied in chapter 11 in even more detail. So the first 35 verses of chapter 11 mirror chapter 8, but here's where that prophecy takes a turn and God begins to show us why all of this is relevant to the end times and his coming kingdom. In verse 31 of chapter 11, we read of the abomination of desolation by Antiochus. Then in verses 32 through 35, we read of the men of Israel who stand up against him and fight back. We know from history that this speaks of the revolt led by the Maccabees. But then, in the end of verse 35, we see this statement, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. This seems to signal a shift in the narrative that Daniel is giving, because he goes on in verses 36 through 45 to talk about another king who does things that do not match the actions of Antiochus Epiphanes or of any other king throughout history. Keep in mind that everything up to verse 35 was fulfilled specifically and exactly as Daniel wrote it, even though it was prophesied hundreds of years in advance. But then he claims that the rest is for the time of the end 
and goes on speaking of a king and a kingdom that to this day the world has not seen. In verse 40, Daniel reiterates that this prophecy of this final king is at the time of the end. And he continues this prophecy of this final king right on into chapter 12, where he describes the time of persecution against the saints that he had introduced to us in chapter 7, connected with the final king of the final empire before the kingdom of God. So in Daniel 11, the prophet takes the abomination of Antiochus Epiphanes and uses it as an example, jumping from this abomination in the Greek empire to the final evil king of the final empire mentioned in chapter 7, who persecutes saints for three and a half times. Daniel writes in verse 36 that this final king will magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. By the way, this is almost exactly the way the end times are described by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where he writes that the wicked one opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Anyway, after this, Daniel goes on in chapter 11 to describe a war that this final king will wage and mentions that the king will have an appointed end. And this brings us to chapter 12. This chapter continues the prophecy from chapter 11, saying that at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. In verse 4, Daniel is again told of this prophecy that it specifically is for the time of the end. And then he asks, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? The answer he is given is that it will be for a time, times, and a half, meaning one plus two plus half, or three and a half times. The angel that Daniel speaks to tells him that this three and a half times is the time in which this last king will scatter the holy people. This gives us absolute confidence that the king in the end of chapter 11 is the same as the king who persecuted the saints for three and a half times and makes war against them in chapter 7. Remember this king in chapter 7 was connected to the fourth and final empire, not with the Greek empire. So he is certainly not Antiochus Epiphanes the Greek. And he is said to reign right up until the Messiah destroys him to set up the kingdom of God. Now, we'll see later when we dive into Daniel chapter 9 that there is another abomination of desolation mentioned there. And this one takes place in the middle of a period of seven years, meaning it takes place three and a half years before the end when the kingdom of God comes to the earth. So chapter 7 says an evil king will persecute saints for three and a half times. Chapter 11 and 12 say that this king will commit an abomination like Antiochus Epiphanes, and then there will be three and a half times until the end. And chapter 9, we'll discover, teaches that there will be an abomination by an evil king in the middle of the last seven years before the kingdom of God comes. On careful examination, the prophecy fits so perfectly and becomes so very clear, doesn't it? So the abomination of Antiochus in the Greek Empire is mentioned in chapters 8 and 11 because it is clearly a picture of the abomination of the final king in the end times part of the fourth and final empire. These are not contradicting accounts of one abomination of desolation. They are prophecies about two different abominations, the first one being a picture of the last. In fact, that is exactly the entire point of chapter 11, 
it follows the history of Greece leading up to the abomination of Antiochus, then it jumps directly from his abomination to the end times, speaking of this final king of the fourth empire who will also commit another abomination in the temple and persecute the people of God. Anyway, getting back to Daniel chapter 12, what is very interesting is the answer to Daniel's next question. In verse 8, he writes that after the last answer, he still did not understand. So he asked again, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? The reply he gets is threefold. First, he is told again that the prophecy is for the time of the end meaning that Daniel was not expected to understand it. Then he is told some rather generic things about the time of the end, that many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. On a side note, this is actually kind of cool, because it seems to be a reference to the salvation brought by the Messiah and accepted by many people before the time of the end. It seems to be talking about you and me who are Christians. Anyway, the final third part of the answer Daniel has given was a very specific response to his questions about when these things would end. He was told that from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and thirty-five days. This tells us several important things. First, it means that we are still definitely talking about a different abomination than the one by Antiochus Epiphanes. Why? Because after the abomination by Antiochus, chapter 8 tells us that it takes two thousand three hundred days to purify the temple. Here, we're told that believers are blessed if they wait only 1,335 days after the abomination. Clearly, these are two different abominations. Secondly, it tells us that the time, times, and half a time mentioned in verse 7 are definitely in reference to years, because 1,335 days is just over three and a half years. It's one year plus two years plus the dividing of another year. Daniel was told that the persecution of saints would last for a time, times, and the dividing of times in chapter 7 and in verse 7 of chapter 12. And now he is given the exact number of days in those three and a half times, 1335. The times referred to then are definitely years. But why are there two sets of numbers? Why 1290 and 1335? Well, we can't be sure, but I think, based on the context, that there are two things being declared in this prophecy. One is that the people of God will be persecuted, and the other is that the kingdom of God is coming to this earth. It makes sense then that these two numbers count down to both of these things. After the abomination of desolation, the people of God will be persecuted, but God will cut that persecution short 1290 days after the abomination, giving his people respite. 45 days later, when 1335 days are accomplished after the abomination, the Messiah will return to set up the kingdom of God on the earth. Of course, it is possible that this first time period could refer to something else besides the persecution of believers. But Jesus did say, when referencing this prophecy in Matthew 24, that there would be great tribulation against believers during this time and that those days would be cut short. This seems to reinforce the theory that 1290 refers to the persecution that God supernaturally cuts short 45 days early. But whatever the 1290 day countdown leads us to, the 1335 day countdown is abundantly clear. It is the blessed end that Daniel was asking about. It is the theme of the entire book. It is the coming of the kingdom of God.
chapter 2 counts down the world empires until the coming of the kingdom of God. Chapter 7, again, details the empires that lead up to the kingdom of God, saying that the final kingdom of this world will end with a three and a half year period of persecution right before the kingdom of God. Chapter 8 and 11 speak of the Greek king who commits an abomination in the temple that is a picture of the last king and the end times who rules right before the coming of the kingdom of God. And chapter 12 gives us a to the day countdown from this abomination of this last king until the coming of the kingdom of God. So we know in the future there is a kingdom right before the kingdom of God comes to this earth that will persecute saints for three and a half years and will be ended when Jesus returns to claim the kingdoms of this earth. What do you think? As I've said, I've skipped one very important chapter of Daniel, chapter 9. I did this because I thought it was necessary to understand the rest of these chapters before tackling chapter 9. But I want you to know chapter 9 also gives us a countdown to the coming of the kingdom of God. This one is a different kind of countdown though. It's not counting down world empires from Babylon or counting down the days from the abomination. In chapter 9, we see a countdown of exact years from the time of Nehemiah who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem until the Messiah, Jesus, came. Then chapter 9 will skip an unknown amount of years and start the countdown again seven years before the kingdom of God comes in the future. But don't take my word for it. Read chapter 9 for yourself and let me know what you think. Check back in here on The Bible Explained in a week or two to hear my thoughts on the chapter. And don't forget to let me know what you think in the comments below. Now, before I go, I want to sincerely thank you for watching this video. If you like this content, don't forget to hit subscribe to support the channel and to see more content like this. And follow The Bible Explained on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Bible explained. I really appreciate the support. Also, I want to remind you that the entire Bible is ultimately about one thing, the redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible tells us that all men are sinners and that we must pay for our sin against God for eternity in hell. That's definitely the bad news. But you see, the Bible is all about this one thing, the good news that Christ died to pay the penalty for our sin on the cross. Since your sin has been paid for by Christ, all that is left for you to do is to turn from your sin and accept his salvation by faith. If you've never accepted this gift of God by faith, won't you do that today? Leave a comment or send me a private message on Facebook and I'll be happy to talk to you more about having your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ.